Should protesters be held financially accountable when their demonstrations turn violent? Or would this risk chilling free speech? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. On this series, Speaking Freely, we talk from time to time with participants in the free speech drama unfolding in America. Today, Scott Martin, a Republican state senator from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Senator Scott Martin from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Very glad to have you in our studio and have a chance to talk about your your bill uh, to hold protesters responsible. I may misstate this, so I hope sure, you'll sure. correct it when I, when, if I do. Hold yeah. protesters responsible for any costs of their protests. Well, first, thank exactly? you for having me here. I appreciate it. Uh, it's partly uh, true. Uh, really, it looks for folks who are convicted of certain crimes. Um, that they would be responsible for the protest costs that occur um, in those types of situations. And Econo is modeled, we ha already have somewhat in place uh, uh, for terroristic threats. If, a, if someone makes a terroristic threat and there's evacuation at a school or a mall and there's a massive police response, that those costs could be put on them as well. That's a state law in Pennsylvania. Oh, it's a state law currently in Pennsylvania. Right. Uh, so basically what I did was um, uh, for, for two reasons. One, we had a major pipeline project coming through as Marcellus Shale gas becomes bigger in Pennsylvania. Right. Uh, the Atlantic Sunrise Project came uh, pretty much um, in, a, in a vertical fashion right down through Lancaster County and it was a pretty controversial thing. And on the heels of uh, the North Dakota Access Pipeline uh, protest where some of our folks who were anti-pipeline from Lancaster County were out there. There was they, a were, lot of, they were protesting in North Dakota they were as out, well. Some of them were out there as well. I see. Uh, there was a lot of worry by people in our community as to could that occur here. And in the aftermath of North Dakota where you saw the state and local government left with over 40 million dollars in local costs for law enforcement, for cleanup, something like 23 million pounds of trash 40 abandoned vehicles, slaughtered cattle. I mean, it was a pretty ugly scene. Um, that went on for a long time. That went on for a long time. And so in, in getting ahead of that, and, and as you're aware of seeing um, you know, the incidents in Baltimore and Ferguson and Charlottesville, uh, where people were taking basically what I 100% believe in someone's right to free speech and the peaceful gathering of individuals to express their dismay uh, with anything. But when people were starting to cross the line and saying, you know, your rights does not include, the right to protest does not include your right to set things on fire, the right to destroy someone's property. That was what kind of led to saying, how can we look at this um, and have that community conversation? Um, and that was the genesis of why this bill came So tell me about the pipeline in your sure. county, in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, I gather there are some people who are discontented about it and who have... Yes, absolutely. Person, ...including an order of nuns in... in yes, you know, and uh, I'm very familiar with that. Going back to my days before getting in the Senate, I was a county commissioner when this first... And we had the first public hearings on this. Uh, we actually got the company to actually move 50% of the line away from natural areas that people were worried about. Um, so they rerouted the... Oh, pipeline. rerouted it. Uh, we were trying to get it away from sensitive natural areas and putting it onto farmland. Most farmers in Lancaster County are like, hey, as, long, as long as you reimburse me for crop damage. And we're also an area that had six major pipelines that already came through certain really? aspects of it. You know, and no one really talks about that. But obviously with, I think the politics of fracking and, and those, it kind of bleeds into this pipeline sure. issue. It's been uh, a big controversy oh, over fracking. Uh, absolutely, and so we, uh, we wanted to try to be very proactive and ahead of the game as, as pipeline development is growing in Pennsylvania uh, as the Marcellus region was developing. Uh, we knew this is something in the current environment of where we see bad things happening at protests to try to get ahead of the curve. So where do things stand at this point? Has the pipeline been built? 
The mo I think right now they're currently at about the halfway point. Um, and I know halfway through the county, half through Lancaster County. Right. Now we'll say what's interesting is this pipeline. I live in a place called Marduk Township, Pennsylvania. It's going in across the street from my house. You know, and so are I, you protesting? I was not protesting, <laughs> and, and um, but most of it's underground now. Uh, they're obviously planting grass or whatever vegetation back over top of it in a lot of the areas. But you know, we did have uh, some areas. I think up. You mentioned the the uh, the Saint Anne's retirement community, right. the, the nuns there. What about the nuns? Concerned well, about it? yeah, you, you know. Part of me believes that the nuns were being taken advantage of by some of the outside groups. Um, you know, the interesting dynamic with the nuns, you know, and as a Catholic, I have to say that, you know, I'm not speaking, they, they have a wonderful mission. Part of me was a little upset because if you go on their website and look at their retirement community that they sell, one of the top things that they tout as an amenity to live in their community is central gas heat. You know, and in here, they were upset about, and this was a farm that was next, that they owned the land, mm -hmm. that it would be coming through that area. Uh, so there's mixed feelings in Lancaster County. Overwhelmingly, the vast majority of Lancaster County and support uh, the building of the pipe. We're used to it. We have it. Um, Does it have advantages for the county? Does it make energy more affordable? Well, these are affordable? open. One of the things that we, they tried to uh, get rid of that whole thing that this was all going overseas to Russia, and that was a big talking point. This is all exported. In reality, the way it, it's an open access line. So in Lancaster County, and they may have had it up in the Wilkes-Barre area back in the area, is uh, like UGI Utilities. It's the smaller yeah. gas companies. If they get enough interest in opening up a, a, a natural uh, gas market, you can tap into the lines there. The pipeline's basically just the transporter. And that's how they basically sell these things to, to the uh, FERC. They'll say, you know, we have a buyer. FERC is for, the Federal Energy Regulatory yes, Commission. They'll say we have a buyer for at least 10 years of gas, and that's where they route the pipeline to. Here, UGI in Lancaster County could tap in, or a major, let's say, manufacturing plant. And we've actually seen that occur in Lancaster County uh, in other places. You know, a big Lancaster County thing, Shady Maple Smorgasbord. Big, you know, uh, place where people go and eat way too much. You know, uh, they actually tapped into a line not too far from them. They saved almost, I think it was three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year in energy costs. Really, so much to the point. Just the one one institution. one institution, the Eastern Lancaster County School District saw that they ended up tapping in and saved a quarter million dollars a year for their building. So it all depends. If you have a buyer, you can tap in. You, uh, right. you know, and, and that's what's hopefully going to occur. And looking right now, 50% of Pennsylvanians don't have access to natural gas. Now, your bill, as I understand yes. it, includes religious observances as a kind, as a part of protest that yeah. would be covered by the bill, where there would have to be Well, the bill would basically any any protest. Regardless, that were people. But it includes up. explicitly religious observances, does it not? Anything that would require, if someone would commit a crime that requires a massive police uh, response, that that that's basically there was no litmus test whether it was religious or non-religious. Um, and you know, listen, I'm not a curmudgeon. There's no, the only a lot reason I raise it is the nuns were opposed, and I thought that was they. they felt well, I never, f I personally haven't never heard from the nuns being against my bill. Um, I have heard from some of the groups that they've been putting together, they built a chapel on their farm. Uh, even though it's not officially a chapel, the bishop never uh, recognized it mm -hmm. as such. Um, I think a lot of them looked at it as a way for me to try to undermine their efforts. In reality, I, as a county commissioner, I oversaw emergency management. I know what it's like for these resources to be expended. Uh, big one, EMS. You know, a lot of these things, ambul many ambulances come. A lot of folks don't know. Even if they, no one needs medical attention, it still is a real cost, and then they don't get reimbursed from it for whatsoever. So have you had protests on the order of the ones in North Dakota? Has, has there been? No, we, we, we didn't. The, the most expensive one that we had, we had three ladies who uh, they uh, blocked off an, uh, basically an entire neighborhood, and they put their hands in these concrete contraptions that have a metal bar inside, and they wrap chains around their hands. And it's almost impossible to pull, just with the leverage of the chain, for law enforcement or whomever to pull it out. So it's a very intricate, almost surgical procedure with these concrete chippers. And it was, I believe it was the state police that were involved in that one. That incident in itself cost about $75,000. It shut down the neighborhood for over four hours. People were just very upset. Now, were they arrested? They were, they, they were arrested. And were they tried and convicted? Uh, I don't believe they've had the court. This was just 
uh, not too long, it wasn't too long ago. We've had about four or five incidents um, and we're actually tracking what all the costs were. We're gathering all so, the data. So your bill, yes. if, if they were convicted and if your bill passes the yes. state legislature and is signed by the governor, yes. a lot of ifs, yeah, a lot if, of that, ifs. if that happens, they could be held responsible for those $75,000 in costs that you say absolutely cost the state police to do this. Absolutely, that, that, that's where it would. Now the court, it'd have to be obviously applied by the court. And what's different about this bill too is um, a lot of times, let's say they were arrested by a local police department and they're, they're charged and they go through the process. Uh, a lot of people don't ever really think about what all those costs were. Well, what this bill is, it allows a local government entity, let's say maybe it's the county emergency manager, to be able to petition the court during that proceeding to say, so you know, these three individuals cost the taxpayers of our, our uh, commonwealth or our county or local municipality, you know, X number of dollars, and we would like to be reimbursed for that. And uh, that's a, something you don't see happen often. Sure. You know, I always wonder about things like that when it's say it cost you know half a million dollars to defend the community yeah. uh, in the times of protest and people clashing in the streets and so yeah. on. Is that necessarily extra money or is that money that's already been allocated which is just used, resources that are used on this particular occasion? Yeah. Uh, it, it, if they're not used, if, if the taxpayer, if the police are not out doing yeah. this, is somebody going to get money back? Or I, well, I don't quite understand how it's calculated. Well, you know, for instance, let's look at what happened in North Dakota. In North Dakota, they were expending out of their current year's budget. Um, and for instance, I think one of their departments, I think it was their local sheriff, they were like a countywide sheriff there. They uh, were basically, they flew through almost an entire year's worth of their budget. So they were over budget. Oh yeah, so by the time they're into their, by the time where they were starting to literally run out of money in their allocation, they would have to be reallocated money from somewhere. It would have right. to come from. Right. And I fully realize it's just like this in the criminal justice system um, when you assign a, you know, victim restitution to an offender. You know, there's, there's cases where people, if you swindle someone out of $30,000, and you're the kind of person that you went through the process and you ended up getting a job, you're on a payment plan for you know, $20 a month for the rest, the victim may not, it will be a long time before the they see won't real. see much restitution right. in that case. But part of it is to say, before someone thinks about picking up that trash can okay, and throwing so. it through a glass plate window at a store and it's on fire, you know, to think about you know, not doing that. So your real point here yes. is to serve a deterrent effect, to try to prevent Absolutely. some of the protests that have been taking place. No, and, and I will say, when my bill was first introduced, um, it started a broad community conversation. I heard from Tom, overwhelming support from the community, including people who literally, maybe they didn't like the fact that the pipeline was coming through their farm, if there was somebody like that, that they would contact us. They, they saw what was going on in other places. And they well, we don't want this to happen here. I don't want damage. A lot of insurance companies don't even cover those kind of costs. That's what a lot of people the don't realize. The cost of the damage from the yeah, protest. Yeah, if you would have a protest on your prop, let's say they got onto your property and you know killed your cattle or, or set fire to your barn or, or whatever it might be. And why would that happen? Why does that actually happen that, that protesters would kill the cattle? Oh yeah, they had. I think it was twenty some slaughtered cattle in North uh, Dakota. Oh yeah, in North Dakota, um, they literally people uh, left like something. It was something dozens and dozens of dogs who were abandoned and left there. Their cars, cars that were either, they set their car on fire and left it burned out. Um, it was a very big mess. Some of the images from there, and I'm not getting into the, oh, the police were too you know, rough or, or the protesters were too violent. When all the smoke cleared, it literally was just devastation in what was the federal game land. And that's what the, the North, state of North Dakota and the local county there, which I can't think of off the top of my head, they were like, President Obama, you, t you chose to say they could have the protests there. You weren't going to remove them. And then they were left with this, this huge price tag and efforts to clean up their area. And it's, uh, you know, when you add that to, you know, Baltimore, what occurred in Baltimore, which is just south of where we are, people see these things and worry about, well, who's going to clean up? Who's going to be responsible to pay all of this and clean this up? And, and that's what we were trying to get ahead of. And that conversation, I think really helped. We got a lot of those, the protest groups, openly commit over and over and over again. We're committing to peaceful protest. We're committing to peaceful Isn't that protest. what it is for the most part, peaceful protest? I mean, isn't, yeah. isn't that the tradition? Yeah. 
I, and I, I agree with that. That's what and makes especially our on great. environmental issues, I think, yeah. isn't that mostly peaceful yeah. protest? I, I think most, but we have a long history of this country of having peaceful protests. And, I, and nothing in my bill did I ever want to. And we even adjusted it some point. Because, I mean, you look back to the Boston Tea Party. So, yes. you know, they dumped tea in Boston Harbor. Yeah. Right, May right. have raised the cost of tea. <laughs> right, right, right. Raised the cost of tea or called in the local, I don't know what they called them, but I guess they were sheriffs back then. Right. Um, but, you know, we it's threading the needle in these kind of discussions, the ability to thread the needle to not impose on someone, let's say you're standing on a sidewalk and you get swept up in this and the police say, yeah, you were there. Uh, and so well, that you gotta, often happens. Oh, so. yeah. And, and I understand that. And, and I get that. And I don't blame the police because when it's mass chaos, you know, chaos going on. But my real thing was to incorporate the judicial process and the conviction aspect uh, to really get to the people who actually make, not only the ones that we're worried about creating damage, but the peaceful people there. And the organization that came there to have a peaceful event, and you have a few, few knuckleheads that show up and start doing things. Now, and it's not a right issue or left issue. It happens all the time. We get these radicals from both sides that come and want to create chaos. Now, is, is that a risk in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. One doesn't think yeah. of Lancaster County as a violent place. Right, or a, right. A lot a, of Anabaptists there at Am right. Amish. And, um, at the point where we were most worried, there was a farm, a farmer who was opposed to the line, who mm -hmm. let, basically, they called it the stand, and they wrote it big letters across their barn. Um, that was the gathering place. And there were already reports from the Susquehanna Regional Police Department that was in that area where even the, the, the anti-group that was stationed there, and they would have trainings on how to protest, mm -hmm. and they were raising money for bail. Trainings on how to protest peacefully? Oh, peacefully. Um, they actually had a few characters show up that they actually called the police and were worried about this. Because there, are, there is a movement um, uh, on many different issues where there's a tran transient individuals who go from these, you know, uh, from protest to protest, and some of them don't always have the best of intentions. And well, what, who are they and what are their motivations? Where I, do they come from? I don't know, but when I, when I see tapes of, of North Dakota, you know, I quickly think, you know what, I, I don't know where these, some of these folks came from. Uh, you thought peaceful area, farming community in North Dakota where you could ever have right. um, something like that happen. Uh, that, that was really what was concerning. Has, are, are you aware of any investigations, uh, FBI investigations, or any investigations of who these don't. I, I transient know protesters might be? I, you know, a lot of the, the folks that are involved in intelligence in the communities that look at a wide array of things, from gangs to, sure. to things like this, sure. I, I'm sure they have to be on, their, on people's radar. Um, but uh, I will give you one other example. One of the incidents in our county where the, the police were called in. I think it might have been West Hempfield Township, not too far from that retirement community. There were seven arrests. And out of those seven arrests that occurred with those individuals, six of them were from New York. Really? They weren't even Lancaster County citizens. So there is obviously a transient group, groups that move around in support of, whether it's an environmental issue, no matter what it might be. Um, but we see that often in, in protests where people from that community. So from my local taxpayers are saying, Great. So that incident, if that incident alone required twenty thousand dollars worth of various response to occur and roads being shut down in convenience, all for six people from New York to come here and disrupt our community, you know, not peacefully in that case. In the in 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 the case, peaceful, who? I, that's okay. I've been protested. They've come and marched and hung things on my door. Have you ever protested yourself? Um, I think yes. Mine's probably more as like a political rally. You know, you have like counter rallies that go on. I think I've done that too. And I've never been exposed to a rally where there's been assaults or destruction or anything right. like that. Right. Um, but I think a lot of us have watched them on TV and said, we don't want that to occur in our community. So what can we do to prepare it? And also, so it's the old sort of concern about yeah. so-called outside agitators that mm -hmm. many people felt during the civil rights movement, for example. That some people in the South said, well, why are these people coming from the North to Right. To disrupt our way of life. Um, it, oh, I'm sure. In the end, made positive changes, though. Yeah. I, I would say the, the, the positive changes in our country, though, um, through the civil rights era, I think the message of Dr. King was very important nonviolent, peaceful protest. He was nonviolent, that's right. Right. I, 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 I hope. And weren't most of the protests nonviolent? Uh, I think so, too. Know? And I, I think 100% believe that if we had more of that in this country, especially in this day and age where it seems to be so much division, 
uh, peaceful assembly and protest to so, me is the way to go. So let me understand. So you're not trying to discourage people from protesting in general. You no. Know. Uh, what I want to discourage is the person who wants to come to this event and create chaos and, and destruction and assault people. That's, that's, to me, what the focus of the bill always was. And I met with a lot of folks who had worries. Uh, I think you and I just discussed about people getting swept up. Right, And right. eventually this bill, I, I really want to address that. You know, if there's things on the bottom end uh, for trust, like summary trespass or misdemeanor, I don't want them included in this. Um, so but you're not talking about trespass. You're not. Talking I don't want about trespass, and that's what if yeah. whatever we have to do. Because in this almost bill, all protesters end up trespassing somewhere. Yeah, you know, and it's it's and it's easy in a mass situation for police to be confused as right. to, right. you know, did that person is that the one that just threw the the brick through the window? Have I, you attracted a lot of bipartisan support in the Pennsylvania legislature for the bill? Um, I wouldn't say bipartisan. Uh, I think in the legislature, most of the co-sponsors that we got on were of the, my same party, um, Republican. And Republican, and uh, in the community, I would say I, I come from a very Republican area in Lancaster County. And most of the people were very supportive of that bill. I'd say most of the people who were opposed, uh, who came forward. I had some Republicans who were opposed, too, in the community, who, who expressed concerns. What was their argument? What we said about people getting uh, swept up in it that maybe just be like a simple summary trespass. Right. And so uh, the, the bill isn't necessarily moving right now. It's still an issue I still want to keep addressing because just because this is one pipeline, there'll be more projects. Sure. So is, is it more symbolic? Is, is it... I mean, do you, do you expect this to become law in, in Pennsylvania? I don't see a scenario where uh, the current governor would sign this bill. This is Governor Wolf. Governor Wolf. And I don't think, I, I think in the final format where the bill can be solely focused on uh, those who truly create a lot, high, high dollar damage to our communities, mm -hmm. that's, I think, hopefully we can get some, uh, um, some buy-in. Because it's not just a it wouldn't just apply to protests. You would ask me about, you know, the religious order or sure. the nuns earlier. This could be in the streets of Philadelphia. You know, this could be in, in Allegheny County, well, in it's Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Up in your old hometown of Wilkesbury. You know, it's. Uh, I didn't want to say this is just a pipeline anti-protester right, right. bill for pipelines because it's not. My motivations, yes, were that was a large part of it because I was sincerely worried in the thirty some odd miles coming through Lancaster County or any other county in the Commonwealth that this could be an issue. So I've, I've read, or, and you've, I think you've said, yeah. that uh, the bill was inspired partly after Charlottesville, after the events at Charlottesville. Well, I think it dropped right after Charlottesville, right. but it had been in the works when for a while. When you say dropped, you put it uh, Yeah, you, yeah, you, you I introduced the, right. the bill. Right, the I'm familiar with the term, but, <laughs> but people might think you were <laughs> right. dropping the I literally bill. dropped it. Right. Um, the co-sponsorship memo had come out in May, and probably the idea when I first started really talking about it probably was back in the when I first came in the office within three right. or four months so I've been early 2017 uh, and it was really on the heels it was that prior fall uh, that the, the the access pipeline in North Dakota right right uh, and but we the started seeing the, cost. the big Charlottesville event if you will mm -hmm. was last August August of 2017 yeah, yeah. and uh, was there was there something that concerned you about about Charlottesville that made you push this harder? or that um, Well, you know, it, it, I would say that it fits into the same category of my concern where, where folks who come for peaceful protest and then you end up seeing assaults and, you know, and God forbid, uh, you know, people getting hit by cars. Um, that, to me, it runs counter to peaceful protest. Sure it does. And uh, that, the more I see... What about that torchlight parade? That, that seemed a little... Worrisome. It does, and I, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, we, we always need to be careful with, listen, we have places where, you know, and it's a big worry when the KKK wants to get on the courthouse steps and rally, you know, and may not agree at all with what they stand for, and it may make us sick to hear some of the things that may come out of some people's mouths when they're standing on those steps and spouting their hate. Um, however, uh, as much as we have the right to say, I can't stand what you're saying, this right. is wrong, they have the right to say right things to even say though it. we don't like it. Right. And, but if they turn around and, and, and start assaulting the counter protesters or vice versa, to me that crosses the line. Right. And to so me, how do you read Charlottesville? Is what, 
what what happened, what what it established, what we have to worry about after Charlottesville. Uh, I'll tell you what I, I'm really worried about in our country is our ability, and this is this is an left or right issue. I point to everyone our ability to sit across from a table, right, and have a discussion and look at each other and say, you know, I think this, and you say I think this, and you know, encounter each other. Well, that is clearly under attack. Oh, it absolutely is. And, and, and that's one of the purposes, by the way, of the Free Speech Project, okay. is to try to figure out how we can have civil dialogue on yeah. the issues that divide us. And, you know, even in, even in legislator, legislatures or in the Capitol here in, 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 in D.C., the days where you had statesmen who were able to communicate back and forth and, and do so in a way that was polite and courteous, and, you know, at the end of the day, you still went and broke bread with each other. You know, one of the best things I ever did in my time as public service was literally after I was elected in 2007, I was 34 years old as a commissioner. We have three commissioners, always. Uh, right, typically always two, two from Republicans. one party and yeah, one right. from the other. Right. In our case, uh, we have two Republicans and one Democrat. We actually took our wives out to dinner together, sat down and established a relationship. Probably say, wouldn't no matter, happen today. You know, yeah, and today it's not. And I, I, I miss that about being a county commissioner because everything seems so hyper-partisan sure. in today's world. Sure. And reality is, you know, hey, I'm a good guy. You're a good guy. We may have a disagreement. Let's go have a beer after this discussion, sure. you know. And that's what I think is missing from today's society. So how did this happen? How did, how did we lose that? It's a good question. I know a lot of people will say, hey, look at the current administration. Well, I, personally, it goes back further. I mean, when you look at where is our, when it, did we become a society that thought that, uh, we lived through an era where people would march and protest and, right. you know, what, whatever era. The I'm 60s. sure you grew up seeing a yeah, lot of that. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, but where did we start seeing the, the riots and, the, the, and, you know, setting our own communities, our own neighborhoods, our own businesses on fire and how that would have a lasting impact? Um, to me, it's where I thought we're losing, we're losing our way. And it was, just seemed like we had one after another after another. And now we have a presidency that it seems like we're even more polarly on, at looking Certainly at different polarized, things. Right. Absolutely. Let, let me ask you one last question. Sure. Um, in uh, 2017, there was a brawl, physical brawl, on the floor of the Texas House of Representatives. Wow. Rather famous. There are photos. Yeah. There are videos of it uh, because of disagreements over immigration policy and. And there were uh, literally members of the Texas legislature who had guns in their pocket with the open carry law, right, or right, right, closed, right. concealed carry law, I guess it is, in Texas. Um, apparently, a lot of the legislators come to work with guns. Mm -hmm. Has it reached that point in Pennsylvania yet? <laughs> well, we're not supposed to be carrying guns at the Capitol. There was a big article about that recently. I guess some members who were worried about safety did. We had some people coming and shooting when our employees were getting out on the steps mm -hmm. of the Capitol. Uh, you, don't, will, you don't carry a weapon to your work? No, I don't carry yeah. one to work. And, um, and are there brawls like in, that? In, are in there the fights capital. like that in the... No, there, there's nothing like that. You know, and, and my message to people of any walk of life, especially those who are in the public camera, um, we need to set an example. Our children are watching. And is this the example that we want to set for future generations on how we conduct ourselves in disagreements? Are the, are the debates civil in the Pennsylvania legislature? Yeah, these I... Days? Uh, I find them to be civil. Um, you know, it's funny. I will put some of this at, on the media, uh, at the foot of the media as well, too, because I will tell you that probably 80, 90 percent of the things that the legislature does is bipartisan. I can't tell you how many votes are unanimous in the Senate. Really? Things, um, some major things that happen every single day that impact people's right. lives. But of course, we get hung up in a 24 hour news cycle on the most contentious of issues. Um, but putting the media aside, that still is a responsibility for us to carry ourselves in a responsible way uh, that you communicate effectively between each other um, and that you, you do so in a respectful way and what we truly referred to early as being statesmen because that, I believe, has a ripple effect into, into the political scene. It has a ripple effect into the, the issue groups that are out there. Um, and it has an effect on our families and our children who are watching how the adults behave. And well, we need that, to get to the point where we are having more thoughtful discussion that's peaceful and respectful of each other. And that's the way it should be. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. We've been talking with State Senator Scott Martin about his bill that could hold protesters responsible for the costs associated with their actions. 
To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.